All right, so go ahead and take out your Bibles and turn to the book of Ezekiel. So we continue on our journey through this book. The plan tonight is always a fluid plan, but a couple shorter chapters, so we'll see how far we get. I'd like to get through um, chapter 6, and we're starting in chapter 4. Uh, just to remind you what's going on here, uh, just a lot of intense things going on. It's a terrible time for the nation of Israel. One of the worst times that they've ever experienced, actually up to this point for sure. Uh, worst time they've ever experienced. And God keeps speaking to them through the prophets, trying to get their attention. And... Right now, um, Ezekiel's the prophet, and he's he's speaking um, in regards to their second deportation. So the Babylonians were actually God's instrument that He used to judge them. So in the first um, deportation, that's where Daniel was taken captive, and then Ezekiel was taken in the second deportation, and and that's where. The um, Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, set up his um, king to rule over the area. And um, Zedekiah was his name. And so this is a time that um, a lot of you have been through Jeremiah with us. So there, there's just a little bit of uh, overlap in this section of scripture. But um, Ezekiel's talking about the things that are going to happen just probably about four to six years before they actually happen. So, um, you know, you, you kind of ask yourself, so what's in it for me? You know, that's when you get into to scripture, I think that's generally what we think. I don't know if some of you are doing the one year Bible. Is anybody reading through that? Can I see a show of hands? A couple people. Um, so, so, you know, sometimes you read through that and you, you think, do I need to know this? Why is it, you know, is this, should I just skip through this kind of stuff? Um, I just want to encourage you that um, everything in the Bible is there for a reason, right? And there's a, so much left out. Even in John, he says that, that, you know, everything that Jesus did, if it were recorded, it wouldn't even be able to fit into all the books. So everything that is written, all Scripture, Paul says, all Scripture is profitable all of it so kind of look at it from that standpoint and when you understand that that in everything there's something there um or else you know god's not going to just make us randomly read things like some of our teachers in high school or college or whatever just you feel like they're just torturing you <laughs> but you know we're in, in in these sections of scripture that um they're there for a reason and so I always try to try to think, so Lord, what do you want me to get out of this? And there's a lot of different angles, right? It's, that's interesting. So we can read this, and sometimes we we see ourselves in Ezekiel's sandals. Sometimes we see ourselves in the sandals of hopefully not the Babylonians, but maybe you look. Oh, I'm, I'm like more like the Babylonians. Hopefully not. You need to repent. But if you're some of you see, you know, you see yourself like the the Israelites, you know, and then you can kind of look at it from the, the standpoint of a, a national standpoint. You know, these are judgments that are happening. So God actually does judge. You know, that's something we don't like to hear. But um, why does he judge? What's the purpose of his judgment? Um, how do we avoid his judgment? So in all these scriptures, the, the central piece of that is we have to, have to pray and, and, and ask ourselves, how does this relate to Jesus Christ? Because um, all scripture, the volume of the book is written of Jesus Christ. And, and then in particular, the gospel. So how does this somehow picture or portray the, the gospel of Jesus Christ? So, you know, try to ask yourself those questions. But when, when you approach the Bible, just have this approach knowing that these are the very words of God. And God desires for me to know him better through it. And he has something there for me. There should be an ex, uh, expectation. 
but also uh, try to avoid just reading for information and knowledge. Try to read and study for Jesus Christ himself. Closeness, intimacy, devotion, things like that. And in some scriptures, it's, it's harder, you know, because there's a lot of historical things in here. Um, other scriptures, it's easier. But all at the same time, press in to Jesus through all that. So with that, in chapter 4, now we're just continuing on. Ezekiel saw this vision of God, and then he's called by God to proclaim truth to a people that he said they're not going to listen to you. But that was his mission, to proclaim the truth to a people that were not going to listen to him. And he said, they're very stubborn people. They have like, like hard foreheads, but I'm going to give you a harder forehead. So that you will be um, purposeful and determined in your calling and your mission and not give up. And he really needed that. Because God is going to amazing lengths to reach people that he loves so much. Have you ever thought about that? How, how amazing God is he, to, to go and communicate to us. That's what I see in this, is how, how far God is going to communicate, even after continual hard-heartedness and continual rebellion. So chapter 4, verse 1, let's get into it. It says, You also, son of man, that's a common phrase, that was used in, to refer to Ezekiel. He says, um, take a clay tablet and lay it before you and portray on it a city, Jerusalem. And lay siege to it or against it. He says, build a siege wall against it. Heap it up, a mound against it and set camps against it also and place battering rams against it all around and moreover take for yourself an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city and set your face against it and it shall be or it shall be besieged and you shall lay siege against it and this will be a what assigned to the house of Israel. So what's going on here? Well, you, you start to discover that God uses Ezekiel and his calling to Ezekiel is to show in many cases uh, visually what God is going to do to, to help them understand. It's almost as if, if God is just eliminating every possible excuse that they can have you know some people say well i'm a visual learner so all that stuff isaiah and jeremiah i didn't get any of that because i'm a visual learner well god says okay ezekiel so basically ezekiel's to like go on the ground and, and start playing army men did you ever play army men when you're a little kid it, it, you know army men legos um what else we got um what lincoln logs <laughs> Yeah, rector sets, remember those? So, but it, in, in his day, so he just had this clay tablet. That's usually what they would use to kind of write on things. And, and he was to, to build, Plato's another good one, or clay. Remember clay, you build stuff. But he was just to build all this stuff. So build Jerusalem, build a siege wall around it. What's a siege wall? Well, um, this uh, was spelled out in the book of De uh, Deuteronomy of uh, basically how to besiege a city or how to overtake a city. And, and so what they would do is they would build a siege wall around the city. That would enable the people who are attacking the city to have kind of a headquarters and be able to camp safely. But it also would cut off the food supply and things going into the city. It also prevent the people from in the city to go out of it. So he's basically just saying, lay this all out. And remember, so um, time-wise, chronologically, the first uh, wave of um, conquering from the Babylonians has already happened. And the second one is about to happen. 
So he's telling him that, and then there's going to be a third one where the city is finally destroyed. So he wants them to build all this stuff and basically illustrate what's going to happen to them. And then he says, lie on your left side. So from his direction, if, if he was facing Babylon, or if he was in Babylon, it, laying on his left side, you'll see this in a second, See, he would be facing the northern kingdom of Israel. So he was to build this thing, lay down on his side, and it says, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that you lie on it, you shall bear their iniquity. So now he's to, to portray to them that he's, as he's laying on his side, that he's taking the sins of Israel and the city that he built is right in front of it. And then it says in verse 5, he says, for I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days, so you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. Now, 390 days, nobody's really sure where that number came from or why that number is there. There's a lot of different avenues you can explore. And, and all the um, theories in regards to that number never come up to the exact number of days. So whatever it is, I'll leave that to you for your investigation. But the point was, there is a certain time frame of their iniquity that he was to portray. And so he used to lay on his left side for 390 days. Now the question is, was, was, that, was he just doing that a part of the day? Was he 24-7 laying on his side? Most commentators believe there are just specific times of day that he was to lay on his side. We don't really know. But the point was, for 390 days he had to lay on his side and it would be a constant message to the people. A visual message to the people. Now, think about this for a second. Because it's, it's really easy to see this and miss some of the very important things. And the things that apply to us, maybe. And could it be that, that the Lord is continually saying something to us that we're ignoring? Maybe it's more than 390 days. Maybe he's trying to get our attention over and over again. And we're ignoring it. That, that's, what the, that's what's going on here. So I want to I wanna sort of get us thinking about the possibilities. We look at this, that we'd say, Lord, is there something you're trying to get me my attention? Is there something I'm blind to? Is there something that I'm ignoring is there there's just something that that I've been missing all these things or maybe I know but I, I don't want to see it I'm ignoring it so he gives them this visual demonstration a constant warning day in and day out I don't know if they had to step over him or what but I find it very interesting also that it, it, Ezekiel if you want to look at it this way he was warning them, and he was kind of an innocent party. He, was, he wasn't caught up in their sins that they had, but yet the iniquity fell on him. It's interesting, huh? So let's look at that a little more. In verse 6, he says, And when you have completed them, the 390 days, he says, Lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah for 40 days. He said, I have laid on you a day for each year. So now, 390 is up. He switches over to the other side. He's facing Judah. So remember, uh, the nation of Israel was divided into north and south. And that's uh, when the nation of Israel really started to get weakened. They even fought with each other at times. Um, the Bible says that you know, one of Satan's strategies is division, to cause division. Um, Paul talked about uh, sectarianism, which is 
Some say I'm of Apollo. Some say I'm of, you know, Paul. You know, this constant division in the body of Christ. And we've, we've, we see that now. We've always seen that. We have to be very careful that we understand that the body of Christ overall is one body. And we, we should not make artificial divisions to separate ourselves, to group together, to huddle in people that are like us as long as we're acknowledging and accepting the basic doctrines of Christianity, the essential doctrines of Christianity. So that's important. So the nation of Israel divided and, and a lot of the divisions that happen today where churches split or in a lot of cases it's carnal. It's fleshly. That's what we've seen with the children of Israel. There's, there, there's something in our flesh when we're dominated by our flesh that we're going to have division. We're going to separate. We're going to pull apart. The opposite is true if we're in the Spirit. When we're in the Spirit, there's going to be unity. There's going to be a lack of pride and arrogance trying to push our own way. But there's going to be something that we see in the Bible quite a bit is uh, submitting to one another in love. So that's how we have unity. We have submit to one another in love. But how do we do that? We do that because we're most concerned about the glory of God and not our own thing. So how many church denominations have started because somebody wants to do their own thing and they're mad at somebody that's doing another thing? So and that's not to say, you know, there's room, you know, for people that have kind of different angles and different ways they want to worship God. Some are, you know, more formal and liturgical. Some are more casual, things like that. But the point is, is God being glorified? Is he the sinner? Are we acknowledging Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the Messiah, and the only way into the kingdom of God? Things like that. So this division now, has weakened them, allowed them to um, have a, a place where God's not being glorified. And specifically what happened, especially for the northern kingdom, is because they split the temple where they worship, the temple was in the south. So the temple was in the southern kingdom of Judah. So what would the northern kingdom, the northern ten tribes, what would they do? Well, Pride would not allow them to go worship in Jerusalem, so they built their own place in a place called Dan, D-A-N, and they built their own idol, golden calves, and they began to worship the Lord in their own way. So you see what happens? It, uh, Satan divides and he conquers, and, and then pride doesn't allow us to be humble, and we don't worship God in spirit and in truth, and it's just this downward spiral. So in verse 7, it says, Therefore, you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and your arm shall be uncovered, and you shall prophesy against it. So he had one arm uncovered in a, a way just to, to show that God's mighty hand was against them, or the mighty arm of God was against them, and it was it was working, it was active. God's judgment was taking place. In verse 8 it says, And surely I will restrain you so that you cannot turn from one side to another till you have ended the days of your siege. Also, take for yourself wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt, and put them in one vessel... And make bread of them for yourself during the number of days that you lie on your side, 390 days you shall eat, and your food which you shall eat shall be by weight, 20 shekels a day, from time to time you shall eat. So as he's laying on his side with the clay model of Jerusalem and the siege wall, and the iron plate to separate them from God really was what that was illustrating. So now he's supposed to eat, but a very specific amount. Um, what was being told here and what was 
being communicated by God is he's, he's saying to Ezekiel, this bread you're going to eat, you're going to have to mix it with inferior grains because there's going to be such a lack of food in Jerusalem. And this is what you're to portray. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's like, I don't know, if you say you have uh, milk and you have short supplies of milk and you're running out of milk, so maybe add a little water to make more milk so more people can drink it. But they're using inferior grains just to make one minimal amount of food for somebody to subsist on. So the amount that's given, he says 20 shekels, that's about eight ounces of bread made up of, of inferior quality um, seeds and wheat. The wheat and the barley, that's good, but the other stuff is this the lesser quality. So what you're going to have is going to be less nutritious, less dense, less caloric, and you're only going to have eight ounces, which it was actually less than a person would be able to eat to survive. So he is going to go into starvation mode. Now he actually had to do this. And so the people would see him and they would, they would see him over that course of time withering away. And as they would see him, they'd see the city being besieged in the model. They would see the iron plate of separating God from them. And they'd see Ezekiel wasting away and this Ezekiel that was wasting away, the, um, he was to portray the iniquities that were put on him from the people. And God is saying to the people that are so hard-hearted to him, that have rejected him, he's saying, I love you so much, my, my guy, my prophet, that I'm going to sacrifice for him for you. So you will see it in God's whole desire is for them to repent but as I think about Ezekiel and as we go through the book of Ezekiel he has a lot of a lot of crazy weird stuff he has to go through but it made me think what would I be willing to go through so that my neighbor would know God what would I be able to what would I be willing to go through so my co-worker my friend that they would know God Am, am I even willing to be inconvenienced a little bit? I mean, you see how much God wants to reach the people. You see that passion of God. And this passion is fueled by the love of God for his people. And he's doing everything he can. It just really resonates with me of how important it is for us to be willing to do whatever, whenever, however, so somebody would know the love of Christ, which, is, which passes knowledge. And I don't believe if, if the stakes weren't high, if this wasn't important, God wouldn't do all this. If there are other ways, if, if there are other um, opportunities to go to heaven, God wouldn't go through all this, but he knows there's not. And he's doing everything he can to get there attention. I just think, man, Ezekiel's laying there. He can't move when he's there. And he's eating so little, he's wasting away. And, and I think from Ezekiel's standpoint, we don't see him complaining. And we see him just being obedient to the Lord. And that blows me away too. Because whatever the Lord said, that's just what he would do. We don't see him questioning, and why do I have to do this? And are you sure about this? And, and there's one thing he kind of asked God to change. We'll see that in a second. But, and I, I understand that, but we'll see that in a second. But do you see what I'm saying? That what it's going to take to reach people is often going to take a sacrifice. It's going to take uh, us getting hurt, admit, not physically necessarily, but our feelings hurt getting discouraged, you know, things like that. It's going to take us, you know, altering our normal course of life. And, and you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth it? But see, we have to have a good understanding of the gospel if it's worth it. That we, we have to know how depraved we are as people, how sinful we are as people, 
And because of that, how needy we are for God. But let's go on. So this this bread that he's eating then goes into the, the drink, the beverage. He says in verse 11, You shall also drink water by measure, one-sixth of a hen. From time to time you shall drink. So that was about 24 ounces. So he was to eat eight ounces of bread and 24 ounces of water a day for 390 days. And then he says, And you shall eat it as barley cakes and bake it using fuel of human waste in their sight. So he was to use human waste as charcoal and make, you know, make this bread and use human waste as charcoal to make this thing. And why is God doing that? That's weird, right? I mean, a lot of weird stuff in here. But all this is God is trying to show them that their rebellion against God, sin, takes us down, it reduces us down to the lowest common denominator. That's what Satan wants to do. He, he wants to defile us to the point of almost, well, we're not human. You know, he wants to demoralize us. That's what sin does. Sin demoralizes people. It reduces them down to animalistic levels. And yet God created us, what, in his own image. We are image bearers of God. And this is not God's intention for us. And so now Ezekiel, this is where we, we see him finally get a little rattled. Um, in verse 13, he says, Then the Lord said, So shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, where I will drive them. So that was to be a picture of them when they go into Babylon and all those idols, those false idols, Babylon was a, just filled with false idols that that was to be a picture for them that they were going to be eating defiled bread there. And so on verse 14, so Ezekiel says, Oh Lord, indeed I've never defiled myself from my youth until now. I've never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, nor has uh, an abominable flesh ever, nothing of abominable flesh has ever come to my mouth. And he's saying he's going back to the, the laws about, you know, touching dead animals and being defiled and impure. And this is very interesting. He didn't complain about the lack of food. He didn't complain about laying on his side. He didn't care about it not being able to move. But now he's upset because it, here's this is amazing revelation about Ezekiel. He was so concerned about honoring God. And cooking the bread on human dung, if you will, would defile, according to the law, would have defiled him. And he was so concerned about that. So, I'll waste away. I'll lose everything. You put the iniquities on me. I don't care. But, but Lord, I, I, I don't want to dishonor you. Isn't that amazing? This gives us a little insight into why Ezekiel is Ezekiel. Why he's been called by God. Why thousands of years later, you and I are reading about... He was just so concerned... Lord, I, I don't want to do anything that's not right before you. But it's interesting because God is almost kind of giving him permission to do this because God is, is showing and wants to show the children of Israel that they, they've, they've already defiled themselves. And God is using Ezekiel to do that. But, but God honors his, his desire. So in verse uh, 15, he says to me, See, I'm giving, you a cow, I'm giving you cow dung instead of human waste. And you shall prepare your bread over it. So that's his reprieve. It's like you're not going to violate the law. Still kind of, you know, kind of gross. But it's cow versus human. So 
In verse 16, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, surely I will cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem. So he's getting the reason why he's doing this. And they shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety and shall drink water by measure and with dread. So when you go through a, a famine kind of condition, think about that. If things are very sparse food-wise, like every little thing you're eating, you're eating it like with anxiety. Like, you, you know, imagine trying to, in, in, like say we had three pieces of bread and we're trying to share it with everybody and we don't know there's no more bread in sight and, you know, I take a bite and then I'm passing around. You're like, oh man, like if I take this a bite, where's it? it's, it's stressful. You know, the, the rations were, were, were so low. So you get this picture that God is, is presenting through Ezekiel, this, this constant pressure of stress, this constant thumb of God upon them, this constant um, God turning his face. That's what the iron plate was that, that Ezekiel was to put between himself and the city that he built. built. So that's, that's just a, a condition where there's no place to go, there's no help. But imagine this. This also is portraying the tribulation period on earth that's few, still future. But you know, something I was thinking about when I was reading this, this Ezekiel kind of reminds me of, of Jesus. The iniquities that are put on him, he was, he was innocent. The weight that he, that he had to have, the, the warning and the pleading with people that he portrayed. And um, so we get this amazing, to me, amazing picture of how gross our own sin is and how it went on someone else. And in that someone else is where we can find forgiveness. So uh, verse 17, last verse, it says that they may lack bread and water and be dismayed with one another and waste away. And he gives us the reason, because of their iniquity. So now in verse 5, he says, and you, son of man, take a sharp sword, take it as a barber's razor. So this is not going anywhere good, right? And pass it over your head and your beard and take scales to weigh and divide the hair. So now this would be, you may be picturing yourself like one of those fancy barber shops where... You lean back and they like put a hot towel on your face and they lather it up with a little brush and it's warm and you have a very highly skilled professional pulls out that straight edge and just really gets a really close shave. This is not like that. He's doing his own hair. Okay, there's no shaving cream. There's no hot water. This would be a bloody mess. He's told to to take the sword and cut his hair off. This would also be very shameful in that culture. To cut off your beard, to cut off your hair is very shameful. So now he's at being asked, you know, it wasn't enough that he was to eat bread with dung, barbecuing it on dung, but now he's asked to cut off your hair and your beard. And he says, He's supposed to do something with the hair. He says in verse 2, You shall burn with fire one-third of the hair that he took off in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are finished. Then you shall take one-third and strike it around with the sword. And then one-third you shall scatter in the wind and I will draw out a sword after them. So these hairs, he's going to talk more about it in verse 12 and give us exactly what that means. But he's supposed to weigh the hair out, you know, the hair on his head, the hair on his beard, on his face. And as he's doing that, he would be bloody. And he is to weigh the, the, the hair into thirds. And he's to do something with different with each one of those, those thirds. So let's continue on a little bit. And then in verse 3, he says, You shall take a small number of them and bind them in the edge 
of your garment. So then a little bit, just put it on the edge, of, like putting something in your pocket, just a little thing in your pocket. And then he says um, in verse 4, Then take some of them again and throw them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. From there, a fire will go out into all the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, verse 5, This is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. Isn't that interesting? You remember, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago, you may have been here, you may not, but we talked about the importance in the Bible. Location is really important to God. Location and timing and things like that, that you go, off, go throughout the Bible that, that God leads people to places and they're described, they're specific places, even... You know, Jerusalem was a specific place. and But it's interesting that God made a nation of people in, kind of in the middle of all these nations. So why did he do that? Very interesting, and it's still there. Right, so this nation, and many people consider Israel, and especially Jerusalem, the, kind of the center of the world. So why is that? So there's a reason that God put them there. There's a reason that God put them in the midst of all these enemies that were all around them. And we're going to see that in a second. But, but one of the reasons is because God wanted to be their God. He wanted to be their protector, their provider. He wanted to be the one that uh, would be the center of them, which means they, they would be the, he would be the center of the world. And in other words, God chose a nation of people to live in a specific place and the whole reason was to bring glory to God so, the, so that everybody would know God. That's why he put him there. But it's interesting, even now, Israel, uh, today they were, uh, there was over 100 bombs sent into Israel from um, the Gaza Strip. So they're living, you know, around in this little tiny nation around all these enemies, all these people um, that are trying to get them. So what is that? Why, they'll, well, they're still there. They've been brought back there because they're there for a testimony. They're right in the middle. Of the, and that testimony, like we read this and we can see God wanted to read the, uh, reach the Canaanites and all these nations that were enemies of Judah or Israel, I should say. The Philistines and the Assyrians, they wanted God wanted to reach all them. But think about that. God still wants to use Israel, who is still surrounded by all their enemies. He still is using them to communicate who he is to the whole world. How does he do that? It, well, one way is divinely protecting them. Divinely protecting them. Divinely, it's amazing. You can go through the history of Israel and see how God's divinely protected them. You can go down through all these lists of, of how God's blessing them, how God brought them back. But what's amazing is how God's divinely protecting them. But see, I'm really excited to get to kind of the closer to the end of Ezekiel. Because it gives us this prophecy of what's going on now, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And, and that's a future prophecy. And it talks about these nations that are surrounding Israel, but they're not border nations. Right? So they're not border nations. And, and we get the, the ancient names of these nations. And what it, the main players... Or what it ends up to be is is Russia, Iran, Turkey, and then a bunch of others. But that's who are those are nations that don't border Israel, but they're trying to attack Israel. They're in Syria right now. So we're seeing this played out now. So you can kind of you know look at these prophecies and say, you know, God was trying to warn them. But we have modern day right now. These are things that are happening right now that we can look at in the same context and say, God is using Israel to communicate things to the world. 
And you know what's going to happen? In Ezekiel 38, a lot of you may know, but these nations are going to attack them. And Israel at this time, they're going to be alone. So they won't have allies. And they're going to be attacked. And when they're attacked, God is going to directly intervene for them. It's not going to be like, He's going to use America to intervene or, or the United Nations to intervene, which they hate Israel anyway. But they're going to be alone. And then God is directly going to intervene. And that is going to communicate things to the world too. So if, if you want to know, kind of, you know, get a pulse on prophecy, on what God is doing in the world, it starts with Israel, starts with Jerusalem, it, it starts with the, a lot of people say the Temple Mount in Jerusalem was like the apple of God's eye. Like that's the center of everything. So be that as it may. Let's read verse 5 in that with that understanding. It says, Thus says the Lord, This is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. That also suggests to us that God is very particular about Israel being in the land. So that, that's a thing that's important for God that Israel's there. So there, I know there's um, disputes about is that Israel's land. Or, well, according to God in the Bible, it is Israel's land. And they're never going to be out. And, and that, there's a reason for that we're seeing here. But also, biblical prophecy says that they have to be in the land in order for Ezekiel 38 to happen, in, for, in order for Revelation, the book of Revelation to happen, all that. So, uh, verse 8, I'm sorry, verse 6, She has rebelled against my judgments by doing wickedness more than the nations, and against my statutes more than the countries that are all around her, her, for they have refused my judgments and have not walked in my statutes. So God is saying that Israel is out sinning pagan nations, out sinning them. Like they're winning the Olympics in sin. They're getting gold medals. They're the top of the platform. They're, they are the sinniest of sinners. He's saying, you're, and, and that's crazy because these other nations around them, they were very sinny. They are very known for their sin. And, and they got ahead. But, you know, part of that is because Israel was completely going against what God had given them. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. So part of that is, Israel was complicit in the fact that they should have known and that God was directly working in them and through them. He had done so many miracles and gave them, gave them so much favor and yet, instead, get this, instead of them being the beacon of light and being a transformative agent in the world for God. Instead, those other nations became more influential on them than they were on them, and they adopted the foreign country's sins, and they conformed to their ways of living instead of being transformed and being transformative in the world. So now they're, they're way out sinning because of the responsibility level. So in verse 7, it says, Therefore thus says the Lord God, because you have multiplied disobedience more than the nations that are all around you, have not walked in my statutes, nor kept my judgments, nor even done according to the judgments of the nations that are all around you. See, you didn't even keep their heathen standards of morality and things. And, and so remember, mainly what they're doing is they're, they took on worshiping all these false gods. 
that the pagan nations were worshiping. So they brought in all these false gods, and yet they still were doing some temple worship. They still were, were doing some of the Jewish things. There still was a temple. They're still doing that. But then they added in all these other things. And we see that today. We see that among many Christians today. Here's something really critical, really important, a very good way to, to kind of discern you know, where you're at and where you're going. Are you more like the world or more like the kingdom of heaven? Does your life reflect more that basically you're living for the world versus living for God? Because the Bible says you can't do both. You're either one or the other. And I think what happens to a lot of us as Christians is we kind of think, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, but you know, I still want to do all the worldly stuff too and, and things like that. But remember, we'll just have one master. And the master that we have is going to be the one we obey. That's our master. And you may say, well, I don't have any master. Yes, you do. Everybody has a master. And it'll be either the God of this age, the God of this world, or it'll be the God of heaven. It'll be Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. But as I say that, we, we have to know we're like the nation of Israel in the sense that we've been placed in the middle of of such hostility to God. So the, the world and how we've been placed in it is, is similar to the nation. of We've been put right in the middle of such hatred towards God. So we can find ourselves in this chapter of are we going to be people who honor God and honor Him by how we live our life or are we going to be people that say we honor God with our lips, like the Bible says, but our heart is far from Him? And it reminds me of what Jesus said. He said, where your heart is, is where... No, wait, where your treasure is, is where your heart will be. You get that? So where your treasure... So think about it. What do you treasure? And that's where your heart's going to be. And that's going to be seen, not by just us saying it or thinking it, but actually how we do things, how we live our life. What we do is going to be reflective of that. So in verse 8, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I, even I, I am against you, and I will execute judgments in your midst in the sight of the nations. And if God says, I'm going to do something, you know what? He's going to do it. In verse 9, And I will do among you what I have never done, and the like of which I will never do again, because of all your abominations. And that's probably having a near and a far fulfillment of prophecy. A near fulfillment is is the judgment with Babylon and probably a fulfillment of God judging them in the tribulation, in the book of Revelation. Verse 10, Therefore, fathers shall eat their sons in your midst, and sons shall eat their fathers. And I will execute judgment among you, and all of you who remain I will scatter to all the winds. Imagine how uncomfortable that would be if we are living in that time and you're sitting next to your dad at church and you're like, oh boy, you hear your stomach grumble, you better take off. Hey, this is heavy stuff. I, you've got to have some levity to that, right? <laughs> but you know what this is showing? This is showing, showing this. We, we can look at that and say that's... That's unbelievable, which it is. But it shows us 
what we really are without God. And, you know, it's easy for us to, to look at that. And, and even a lot of people in, in other situations, in desperate situations, and say, how could they do that? But, you know, when we're put in a certain situation, in a certain position, and we, that when we get desperate, and when there's darkness and evil, sometimes we'll be surprised what we do. If we open that door... To darkness. Do you remember Cain was warned? Sin is knocking at the door. Everything will be fine with you if you just listen to me and do what I say, but sin is knocking. If we open that door, don't ever think that we can't end up somewhere that we never thought we would end up. You know how many people I've talked to as a pastor? And I've heard them say, I never thought I would end up here. I don't know how many, but it's, it's more than I like to think about. And it, we can never say, if we open that door to sin, that we won't end up somewhere. Because the Bible clearly says in the book of Galatians, it says, if we sow to the flesh, we will reap to the flesh. You don't want to reap to the flesh. But if we sow to the Spirit, we reap to the Spirit. What does that mean? That means that, that the more we exercise ourselves in spiritual things, the more we experience spiritual things, the more we're built up in spiritual things. But the more that we sow or have habits or do things that are fleshly, the more our flesh will be in control. And our flesh is really ugly. It's really bad. Have you ever seen like rotten meat with like maggots on it and things like that. I always try to think of that when I think of my flesh, when I get into the flesh. It's ugly. And so we have to take heed to this and say, that's horrible, but by the grace of God, you know, there go I. My heart is deceitfully wicked. I can't play around with these things. These are very serious things. Verse 11 I guess I should refrain from the cannibal jokes then, huh? Uh, Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, surely, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore, I will also diminish you. My eye will not spare, nor will I have any pity. So now this is... This is, seems like where the rubber meets the road for God. A tipping point is when detestable things get into the house of God. So in, in our case here, they were probably worshiping idols in the temple. So there's a mix here, but it, it makes me think in our day and age, what, what we allow into our body into our worship that we have to be so careful about what gets in here you know we have to be watchmen those who are leaders in the church we, we're watching these things sometimes people bring these things in with them that are not of God and would be considered detestable and they want to promote it in here there are new things that that come um, in, like a Trojan horse into the church. And so we have to be watchmen. And we have to watch. We, we can't let these um, waves of new things that are not of the Lord sweep into the church. And, and they, they happen all the time. If you've been around a little bit, you've seen all these new things, all these new movements, all these new um, revelations and these new ministries and all that stuff. And you just have to be careful. And, and how are you careful? Well, it has to be, you know, in the Word. It has to be something that is common in the Word. It has to be something that uh, is established in the Word. It has to be something that, that we see in the life of Jesus, in the life of the disciples, something that we see in the epistles, and, and something that's very simple and clear. And if we don't see that, we don't really need it, you know. And we're all free to do whatever we want outside here, but we don't want to bring that in our worship. 
you know but at the same time we have to be careful when we go home and what we bring in our home because I think our home should be a sanctuary where God can dwell there comfortably that's a whole nother thing but verse 12 and I, I don't know if you guys are keeping track of the time but I think we're good I think we can get it then he says in verse 12 one third of you so he's explaining that where the hairs of the head and the beard are going to go one third of you shall die of the pestilence so I, he's basically saying that this is what this one third represents so pestilence is disease which is common when a city gets besieged uh, and it says and be consumed with famine in your midst so inside the walls of Jerusalem there's going to be pestilence and famine and then he says one third shall fall, fall by the sword sword all around you and I will scatter another third to all the winds so some people will die right uh, out by Jerusalem and then others will try to flee and they'll die a little further out and it says I will draw a sword after them and then in verse 13 thus my anger be spent and I will cause my fury to rest on them and I will be avenged and they shall know that I'm the Lord that is so important I encourage you to underline that it's all through the book but I, I want you to see that there's a very specific purpose for all this that, that the whole point and this is a sliver of God's mercy in this terrible mess of sin and darkness is is this is the only thing at this point that has the possibility to draw the children of Israel back into a relationship with God now how hard does a heart have to get where you have to go through all this in order for there to be some possibility that you will hear from and see God but remember Babylon the place they are going that was the place of idols right so they had idols coming out of their nostrils and you know when they went back into the land they weren't into idols anymore it's sad to say sometimes that's what happens to us right that it was sometimes we get so hard-hearted so rebellious so obstinate we don't listen to anybody what anybody says we start to experience repercussions of our sin and and then we just get more rebellious and more angry until a place where we were so filled with our sin that we say Lord I'm done with this Lord have mercy I, mean, I don't want to do this anymore so that's what he did with the children of Israel verse 14 moreover I will make you a waste and reproach among the nations that are all around you in the sight of all who pass by so it shall be a reproach a taunt a lesson and an astonishment to all the nations that are all around you so it's going to communicate to them who God is see they had an opportunity to communicate to those nations around them who God was by God blessing them defending them providing for them doing all these amazing things but they wouldn't do it but God's still going to do what he's going to do but now they have to be an example that when they disobeyed God they, that people would know he's God so he says in verse 16 I will send against them the terrible arrows of famine which shall be for destruction which I will send to destroy you I will increase the famine upon you and cut off your supply of bread so I will send against you famine and wild beasts and they will bereave you pestilence and blood shall pass through you and I will bring the sword against you I the Lord has spoken just one more chapter so now the word of the Lord came to me saying son of man set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them why is he saying that because 
Now, God is going directly to the place where they would worship <coughs> idols. Right? So this is their whole problem, idols. So now that God's going to the mountains, and He says in verse 3, and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Please underline that. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, to the hills, to the ravines, and to the valleys. Indeed, I, even I, will bring a sword against you, and I will destroy your high places. So that's, that's what they would, or how the Bible refers to the place, of the altars that they built to worship false gods, high places, because they would usually build them on hills or mountains and things like that because they thought they were getting closer to God, but then they would also build their altars up. So these high places. In verse 4, it says, Then your altars shall be desolate, and your incense altars shall be broken, and I will cast down your slain men before your idols. And I will lay the corpses of the children of Israel before their idols, and I will scatter your bones all around your altars. In all your dwelling places, the city shall be laid to waste, and the high places shall be desolate, so that your altars may be laid to waste and made desolate. Your idols may be broken and made to cease. Your incense altars may be cut down and your works may be abolished. The slain shall fall in your midst, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Yet, I will leave a remnant. Isn't that interesting? What does that mean, and why is this being told? Do you, do you remember the little hair that was to be put in the pocket? That's the remnant. What's a remnant? Well, because God had a promise to Israel that their seed would continue forever and that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come through their seed or their lineage, there always had to be a little bit of children of Israel. A remnant. Just a, a, a people that can continue on what God was doing. And, and that's another... If somebody doesn't believe the Bible... These are things that are impossible to happen but for the intervention of God. Prophecy is one of the best ways to show and to know that the Word of God is actually from God. And it's also the best way to know that Jesus actually is the Messiah. It's prophecy. But see here, you know, God said that the children of Israel will continue on all the way till the very end, all the way through the book of Revelation, and here, you know, when their contemporaries were wiped out, a lot the, the people in the Bible that were the enemies of the children of Israel, those people don't exist anymore. The Canaanites and Jebusites and all those sites people. They're not around anymore. But the Jews are. And this is why. So God, take that little hair and put it in my pocket, or your pocket, or the hem of your garment. Because there's always going to be a remnant. They're all going to be wiped up, but I'm going to save a little remnant. So in verse 8, it says, Yet I will leave a remnant, so that you may have some who have saved the sword among the nations when you are scattered through the countries. Then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where they have carried, where they are carried captive because I was crushed by their adulterous heart, which has departed from me, and by their eyes, which play the harlot after their idols, they will loathe themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abominations. So this is interesting. So. Ezekiel speaking for God is saying that what you're doing, it, this is crushing me. God's saying this is hurting me. Now that blows me away to think about something. 
that God has, has given us some ability to actually hurt him, to make him feel broken hearted, to make him feel sad, if you will. Isn't that amazing? So this, this broken heartedness of God, he describes it as him being married to the children of Israel in a relationship, a covenant relationship, and then straying from that covenant relationship, sort of having a, an affair on God. And it says that you know they were, their eyes were like flirtatious with the other gods. And I think about that, just it really blows me away. Because, you know, what God is saying, that, that if we're a Christian, we're in a relationship with God. And when we stray from that relationship and go after and worship the things of the world, then it's like we're walking away and committing adultery on the Lord. That, that's, that's really, to think that, that God gets hurt by that. But you know what's interesting? If you think about it, we also then have the ability to love God by our faithfulness. Now I'm encouraged. Now I can, I can actually bless God. Like I can actually have an effect on Him by how I live my life and honoring Him and worshiping Him. So in verse 10, there's that statement again. And they shall know that I am the Lord. I have not said in vain that I would bring this calamity upon them. Get that. I, I'm not saying this in vain. That's important. Are we taking God's word seriously? Verse 11, Thus says the Lord God, Pound your fists and stamp your feet and say that. That sounds like hard to do. You guys will try that? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Robin's got it. Again, another illustration. Say this when you're doing it. So, Alas, for all the evil abomination of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. And he who is afar off shall die by pestilence. He who is near shall fall by the sword. And he who remains is besieged shall die by the famine. Thus I will spend my fury upon them. There it is again. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When they're slain, are among them their idols all around uh, all around their altars on every high hill on all the mountain tops under every green tree and on every thick oak wherever they offered sweet incense to all their idols that's the extent he's describing these false idols were everywhere just everywhere he said in verse 14 so I will stretch out my hand against them and make a land desolate. Yes, more desolate than the wilderness towards Dibla, which is uh, in the Arabian desert, southeast of the Dead Sea in Moab. I guess just need to know it's a desolate place. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. So we made it. Three chapters. Good job. And uh, I just want to conclude with this thought. Just put it all together. I think the key is that our lives would speak to those around us, to our generation, to whoever God allows in our sphere of influence, that they would know that He's, he's God. That they would know that He's God. I think the best way to do that is to live out the fact that we know that He's God. And let the love of God and the joy of God permeate your life. Amen? Amen.